Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Niels. Uh, I'm head of product at uh, Rebound. And uh, I'm here to talk today a bit about, it, it might be a bit of a bold statement, but yeah, returns can be a bit chaotic. Um, and uh, we're here to, to ad at least address it um, and to help you or at least discuss a bit about uh, how we can address it, how we can resolve it, and how we can also avoid um, uh, the problems with returns. And a lot of people talk about uh, data and returns data and how we can use it um, to, to, to address the chaotic nature of returns, um, uh, in which they come back, in what state they come back. Um, but it's not that easy. And uh, I'm here also today to, to address another dimension in the whole story, which is looking at returns a bit more holistically. And um, we call that omnichannel returns. Omnichannel is, um, I'm just going to go here. So omnichannel is a bit of a, a buzzword, right, in the whole e-commerce space. Uh, everyone uses it differently. Um, if you ask marketing, uh, it's about you know uh, LinkedIn posts and blog posts and websites. Uh, if you ask operations, um, it's about you know having having different carriers in place, having different service options in place. Um, if you ask a consumer, they just want to be able to to go to a website or they want to go to to a retail store. Uh, so it, it the definitions are uh, basically all over the world um, and they're they're completely different. So today we will explore a bit about you know, current challenges that we hear from our retailers in the market. Um, we will, I will try to get you all on board of the, the journey of omnichannel returns and what it actually means for us. Um, obviously, steps you can take to, um, uh, to take control of the chaos. Um, and also using data, um, but not just using data and looking at it, but looking at it to then also orchestrate your returns network. So I'm not making this up out of nowhere, right? Um, I think everyone is, is, is having challenges here. Um, and yeah, these are just a bit of uh, news articles that, that retailers and, and basically the whole industry is dealing with. Um, consumers are expecting to still have returns uh, you know, be free for them, uh, but that is changing a bit what we see. Um, we have the, the retail stores and, and the strategy around what, what do you do with a brick and mortar um, and um, it's it's basically all the inflation, all the costs are rising. So how can we how can we optimize and how can we do that in an omnichannel manner? So omnichannel for us um, does not just mean having multiple carriers in place. It does not mean having a portal for for you know for consumers to initiate returns. It's not just about um, having having a store in place. It's looking at all the sales channels. Um, and making sure that all those sales channels have the same experience um, um, as when they come back. So what does that mean? Is the, the whole e-commerce space is a bit, and not just e-commerce, but the whole um, basically sales space is becoming a bit more complex with all the, the online marketplaces, um, um, the retail returns, so getting you know, out of season back, uh, for example. Um, it's a completely different nature of returns, right? Than just a single parcel from a consumer. So what we have been working on the, the last couple of years is to make sure that we are ready to, to receive and to, to handle and to orchestrate all these channels. Because what we've been seeing, and maybe again a bit of a bold statement, e-commerce is kind of the show pony, right? Uh, that's where, where people look at, uh, okay, how can we get the refund uh, in as, as quick as possible? And how can we get, give the most visibility in the returns? Uh, but yeah. Retail has been a bit, you know, neglected here. I'm not saying that one is more important than the other. I'm just saying, why are we just making sure that the data and also the the experience is is seamless across all sales channels? And that's what the Rebound um, Rebound does. And once we've received it, why is why are certain channels always so so simple? Why are they always going back to your fulfillment center? that is not ready to receive those returns? Why is it not um, dispositioned in different ways? Why are we not looking at data to ship the item back to its next best destination instead of just a standard one? Um, so once in a rebound hub, we can also make sure that we can use the data to sort out and to uh, disposition the data or the products differently. So why would you do this? Um, it's, a, it's a simple question, obviously. Um, Without 
returns data and without uh, streamlining all returns coming back. Um, every parcel or every pallet or every box or every truck can be a surprise. So even though you're optimized on your, on your e-commerce side of things and your, your warehouse knows exactly what's coming back from each customer, there's still a truck knocking on the door with you know, black box uh, retail returns or this crazy Zalando return that um, um, you did not expect or was never um, um, you know, registered as a return. But somehow it appears in your, in your warehouse, right? So this is um, why returns data and also looking at returns a bit more holistically um, can help can help you uh, predict um, what is coming your way. Um, and then with the whole sustainability, um, everyone always likes to talk about it, right? Um, but what does it actually mean? Um, we believe that we can remove a lot of unnecessary movements. So why not stop a parcel or, or a pallet or a complete truck um, in a local country? Why would you completely get it all the way through the reverse supply chain and get it back to your distribution center. If you can use data and you know that the products there are not you know, supposed to go there or it does not make sense to bring it there, why not stop it then and there and bring it elsewhere? And that's what we are um, here to also do. And then when you try to standardize your return streams, um, um, you say, okay, whatever works for, for, for e-commerce will work for retail. Uh, if you try to standardize it like that, the expectations of the of the consumers or the customers uh, are completely different. And um, the, if you if you don't work with the data to to make sure that some lanes will go faster than the other, for example, or some lanes stay local instead of going international, um, the end user will experience very long lead times, which will increase costs on the you know the where is my parcel or where is my order or where is my credit or where is my refund questions. So if you, I talked a bit about sales channels and, and omni-channel. So what does it actually mean um, in terms of data? So what, what can we gather and what can we do with that data? So on the e-commerce side, obviously, uh, one of the key data points that we gather is the return reason. So you can, a lot of, you know, you can ask a lot of return reasons to a customer, but making sure that you ask the right return reasons um, is very important here. And also then trying to zoom out and see that cross you know, your entire landscape. So what we do in our portals, we capture all the return reasons for each item coming back. And it's not just about you know, too small. It's also about, um, um, OK, um, why are we turning? Um, and and w what's not good about it? Is it or size does, or does not fit? Is it then too small? Is it too big? Um, um, and what size uh, is the size wrong? Do you always have this size? That kind of things you can you can leverage, and you can you can zoom out and then see the patterns across your entire product catalog. Um, there's this thing about uh, consumers are registering returns, and uh, but then they, they forget about it. It's just you know lying on the couch somewhere or under the couch, and then it's not coming back even though it's in your system. Um, and making sure that you know. Uh, the data and, and know when something is actually drop off in the physical network. Um, that's what we track. So we don't just look at okay returns registered. We actually look at okay across the globe when is it actually dropped off uh, in the, in the physical network and what does that mean? Because uh, we know the lead times, for example, for all the all the you know parcels coming back to our local hubs. So we can then tell you as a as a retailer or as a as a warehouse. It's coming in three days, and you can expect these parcel, uh, these items inside. Um, on retail, um, retail tends to be kind of a manual um, uh, return uh, activity, so it's usually bulky, it's high value, it's product that's either you know out of season, or it's product that needs to go very fast. But there is no two different ways to handle it. Uh, it's always one uh, kind of a one-stop shop. So. Um, with retail, what we do is we, we actually offer, we put the, the store kind of in the driver's seat. So we ask the store, okay, what do you want to return? How many items are it? Um, do, you want it uh, do you want it palletized? Do you want it on a box? And when do you want the collection to happen? And we will make sure that uh, we will send a courier to collect those goods if it needs to go very fast. If it can wait a bit, we'll make sure that we consolidate and we'll make sure that we gather first, you know, 
a full truckload before we uh, will initiate a courier. Um, and also, what people tend to forget is, re you know, return to sender. So missed field deliveries is also a return stream. And if you don't tackle that one, um, it still returns coming your to your DC, which you do not expect. Uh, and also there, um, we can make sure that we, we capture it and we can register it and we know exactly what's inside. And most of the times, those products are in mint condition. Um, so why, you know, put them with the rest of the of the stock? Why not? Give those a, you know, a, a different lane uh, to go faster and back uh, into um, resale as soon as possible. So, once returns are sent, and here I'm talking again, not just uh, e-commerce. I'm talking also retail. I'm also talking marketplace. I'm also talking return to sender. We make sure that um, everything is normalized in terms of data. So all the Carriers here standing today uh, on the liver, they all have their track and trace integrations, right? Um, so every event in the network is coming, uh, um, is, is being sent. But to normalize that globally is, uh, is something that we do. So data is not really useful if it's, um, if the, you know, the, the French parcels have uh, French status events uh, and, the, and the German ones in German. So you want to make sure you normalize all the tracking data. Um, and that's what we do as well. Um, because we know exactly what's coming, uh, we know basically on an item level, so on a, in, in a unique item level, um, where it is in the network. So is it in the, in the carrier network still? Is it in our local hub? Is it on a line hole to a different consolidation center? Um, is it on its way back to you? So on an item level, we can track exactly uh, where your products are um, uh, globally in our network. Um, and one of the things that consumers really hate is not uh, or having to, to choose or not being able to use the method of return they are used to. So if I buy a product of a marketplace, why is my return experience different than what would, when I buy directly from you? I, I don't care. I just want it to be the same. Um, and um, this is something that we are also offering. So we're making sure that uh, whatever um, sales channel, the return method or the carrier in this case is exactly the same. So, I don't know if you all know, but Rebound has a uh, global network of local, um, local return centers, is what we call them. So these are return centers in every country. Um, so a consumer will never have to ship internationally. They will just see an address on the label which is in that country. Um, that means that uh, a parcel is never on its way more than, let's say, three days. So after three days, we can open the parcel so we receive it in our hub, we open the parcel, we verify the contents inside to make sure that we um, decrease the, the fraud issue that's happening also in this industry. Um, and we make sure that whatever the consumer said they were returning are actually returned. And we can then initiate a, um, a message to the systems saying, hey, this consumer is good to go. You can pay, the, um, you can pay out the refund. Um, what we also do is we make sure that the consumer also knows that. So, um, what you don't want is a consumer being kind of in limbo, not getting their, their status updates and not getting their refund as well. Um, so we make sure that also the consumer gets a heads up. Hey, it's in our local hub. It will be, uh, will be processed in, let's say, 24 hours. Um, because at that point, we know exactly what, what items are in our network or are returned. Uh, so it's no longer a guess. At that moment, decisions can be made, right? We can say, all right, this is a high value product, it needs to be sold as soon as possible because our stocks, for example, in our distribution centers are low. Let's make sure that we get this as soon as possible. Or, um, well, this product uh, is out of season. Um, let's, let's put it on the, you know, on the, on the slower, um, slower road and make sure that it uh, gets here as efficiently and as cost effective as possible. Um, we also make sure that your warehouses or your distribution centers are oriented towards you know, uh, fulfilling. And why do you always need to handle all those returns coming back in different states uh, as, a, as a complete mess? Uh, we need to completely refold, repack, retag. All of those activities we can take away. So we can do that in, the local distribu in, a, in our local return centers and make it all pretty again so that once it um, um, gets um, back to you, um, it's something that is an easy activity to them um, put back on the shelf, ready for uh, reselling to the next co consumer. Okay. 
So using all the data, so using all the, all the sales channel data and making sure it's all aligned, it's all the same, it's all normalized. Um, uh, and if you can really capture it consistently, then you actually have insight. If you don't do this, if you only do this for your e-commerce and not for your marketplace, you, you're missing out on the bigger trends um, of your own product. Um, it also makes, ma makes sense that um, if, you, for example, a certain product is, is spiking on returns, it means something's probably wrong, right? And if it's spiking on too small, something's probably wrong with the sizing. It can be a manufacturing issue, it can be a quality issue. So also this gives you triggers to then, you know, go back to manufacturing and say, hey, something is wrong with this product, can we, um, can we have a look? And that makes sure that in the end, you're reducing your returns. So yeah, yes, Rebound is excited about returns, right? But we're also here to reduce un unnecessary parcel movements or unnecessary movements. And stopping them at the source is one way to do that. Um, you can also make sure that um, with the data, you can understand uh, shopper behavior. So all the return orders that are coming through our systems um, will have flags like this was a discounted, uh, this was bought in a discount, or this was bought by a VIP customer or premium customer, however you call them. Um, and um, by, by flagging that, you can actually you know, see, okay, so VIP customers are actually returning more or m returning less in these markets. Um, and that's data that you can use to then also target those um, uh, consumer groups to say, okay, what can we do about the behavior if, if you obviously need to change it? Um, in the end, that's why also a lot of people talk to us, right? How can we lower our uh, return costs? Well, using the data and looking at returns more holistically, um, you can reduce costs. Um, we don't believe in just looking at parcel rates. Um, because there's way more to it, right? It's the parcel rate kind of covers only the first part, but then we have our local hub, then we have all the transport, then we have all the data, then we have um, um, all the, the legs in between, all the handling. Um, so we believe in looking at um, a return from a total cost of ownership perspective. So you make sure that you take into account that how uh, the better you optimize your journey and you do that on all sales channels, the better um, uh, the experience is and the, the lower calls you get in the end to your uh, customer service. Um, because some product just needs to move faster, um, but if you are not you know, tweaking your, your network or orchestrating your network as such, product is losing value in the returns network. And um, that is one of the biggest uh, cost elements actually of returns. And it's not always taken into account when comparing parcel rates of one provider to the other. Um, you need to have the flexibility to say, all right, product A needs to go fast because um, it's in season now. Um, we need to get it to the next consumer as fast as possible. Um, yeah, and obviously, um, the, what we saw a couple of years ago with all the, the problems around stock, right? Getting enough stock in your warehouses. Um, utilizing the stock that is actually in your returns network in, in an optimal way, uh, make sure that um, you reduce your you know, dependency on your own stock in your warehouses. Um, so using the data of the returns network, you can actually make a decision, wait a minute, we know that in three days, uh, 100 of these products are coming back, no need to place a new order right now. So that's you know, things what you, what you can do to, to use returns also in other sides of the business. And of course, better consu consumer experience or user experience. So uh, retailers will get the credit faster, consumers will get the refund faster, uh, and everyone in the end um, has a nice experience and will come back um, to you as a brand to uh, buy something else. To wrap, to wrap it up, and after that, I have some time for, for any questions, uh, if you would like to, is um, what I'm trying to preach here is to not just look at a B2C or e-commerce return as a parcel, but look at it holistically. So zoom out, look at your all your sales channels, and try to align all the all the yeah, basically sales you're doing because they can end up in a return. And when they do, let's make sure that the experience for all of those returns are the same, so that on the background the data will also be the same, and you can actually look at returns um, in a in a way bigger context. Um, we can take a lot of hassle away. 
um, on, on a lot of things. So we can do it um, on, the, on the carrier side, the management side, uh, on the track and trace side, uh, but we can also do it in our hubs. So making sure that whatever product is coming back to your distribution centers, which are organized to fulfill, um, we can make sure that um, it's all optimized when we deliver. Um, if you feel like this was interesting, uh, please come and see us at uh, stand E60. Um, we love to talk about returns. Uh, we're here all day. So um, uh, if there are any questions, I would like to uh, end it here and you know answer any things that I maybe triggered or sparked, um, if that's okay. Yes, please. Microphone is being yes. great. Uh, interesting uh, presentation, Niels, and uh, and good basic information. But I want to ask a specific: Have you got measurable initiatives that have actually reduced returns? Um, I worked for Philips for 25 years. They put me in charge of returns. I said, take out the stop sheet, replace it with a quick start guide, and we measured reduced returns. Have you got any examples now. like that? Please prepare for your next one-to-one -one meeting on the stand of the sponsor in the meeting room. So you're, you're asking, uh, did everyone hear the question? Okay, because I, I don't have a... Sorry. Yes. I can say it louder. Oh, I, participation for Deliver Era 2024 before we set out. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I got the question. So yeah. do okay. you actually have something actionable that, that you have seen that where you have reduced returns um, for one of our brands? That's what the, you're asking, right? Yes. 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 Right. So, um, so what we, we do is we, we manage returns um, for our brands holistically, and we obviously make sure that uh, whatever returns is hitting us, we manage this as best as possible. If, if we're not getting a return, it means we reduced, basically, we're, we, don't, we don't get one from our brand. So we don't have visibility exactly on, um, uh, on if there we solved a problem for our retailer, um, because the return was never gets initiated. But a good example in e-commerce uh, fashion is what we do is um, we ask, um, so we have two, two basically use cases I think is a good question or a good answer, is we also have some electronic brands. And for the electronic brands, we do um, yeah, what we call kind of a qualification before a return gets initiated on a, on a portal. So what we say is, okay, um, um, we do some checks like, is it in warranty? Have you, have you, is something broken? Um, is the seal broken? So to make sure that we qualify to make sure um, that the return is allowed to come. Um, and we also uh, make sure that we troubleshoot then, indicating, hey, um, maybe this is your problem. We've seen that this is the, the issue that other consumers had, which solved your problem. So we try to kind of intercept the consumer returning something um, uh, in, a, in a portal experience. So that's something that we did. and. Um, what we also do is we try to, um, but that's not really reducing its return, but it's um, it's called exchanges. I don't know if you if you're familiar with the term. So whenever you want to return something, we we actually integrate with the with the brand, and we say, hey, look, they're they're returning this now. Um, can they exchange it for? And we know it's a, a too small of a size. Can we send them a replacement? Um, so we we kind of merge the transaction of the return with a new s sale, basically. So that's it's not 100% a reducing of a return, but it's actually something that we would like to make um, a bit more seamless for the consumer and the brand to make sure that a return transaction is not standalone, but it's actually merged with a, with a new sale. And, and one more question? Yes. Uh, uh, the next question would be, you indicated that you have operations in many countries to help your partners process, handle their returns, and then do you resell them as well for them? Um, so we have done that in the past. So, where, um, so sometimes it's a bit up to the brand, right? So there's this uh, you know, brand protection that you don't want to do in certain markets, um, but uh, we can integrate with um, um, basically 
sales channels. So we can also put product back on a, such a channel, which can be on, on marketplaces, and then we can fulfill and sell um, from our hubs. So yes, that's something we do. And um, so within our hubs, we can do, we call it level one, two, and three processing. Level one, simply moving a box. Level two is opening it up and verifying if it's all okay. And level three is grading the product, so enriching the data there, um, reworking it, so making sure that we refold, we put it in a, in a new bag, we re-tag it, um, uh, we, we replace the packaging. So all of that we do in our level three. And then the, 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 the only other step we need to then do is to put it on, on, on the stock location for it to be sold. And then it's up to the brand if they want to sell that in that market or in a different market, um, because we have you know, global hubs, we can move the product then to a, to a different stock location. Hi. Hi. Um, I have more a question about how you validate if the product is the correct product that comes back. And I exactly need to walk to you because I, I don't want. Uh, sorry. But so my question is, hi, we're from Grover. So we are in the consumer electronics and we have a renting model. So we have a lot of returns. Normally everything comes back as a return. Yeah. Um, of course, there are different uh, return reasons to it, but what is a big pain point is the validation of if it's the correct asset that comes back, and what are the possibilities there with consumer electronics like a grading uh, system? How um, manageable is that system by the customer? Say that we are interested in your system. How scalable is this to set certain parameters and to define what is there needed um, to enrich exactly the data points that we can tap into the flows that you actually have by saying attribute A and B and C, then do this. Yeah, then yep. it's more quick. All right. About it. Yeah, good question. So, um, so what I said indicated about the levels of processing, so level one, two, three, uh, we are now talking about level three, uh, which is um, you can't really standardize grading or qualifying uh, all products between brands, right? So we have built in some flexibility that each brand can give us instructions um, of how to qualify uh, or grade or however you want to call it or rework uh, the products. So um, we have what we call digital SOPs, um, which we show to, to each operator um, um, working in our hubs. So our hubs are are global, so in each hub, the same system is running. So we have one central system that operates them all. And uh, for example, when we scan one of your parcels, um, the the operator will um, it will be sorted to a workstation, and uh, on that workstation, that operator will will scan it, and then we will initiate your basically return um, um, instructions, and then we will say, okay, scan this scan this barcode, or um, or, or you know. Um, patch this up, so that's uh, activities that we do, yes. Okay, great. How does it integrate with the PIM system? So for example, we have a system with our SKUs and the defined logics about it. Can we integrate something like that also easy in your system? That it yes. External? Yeah, so or we have we a... we need to input it, upload all that data to your system and then your system links to the correct asset yeah. and the asset information that then the operator sees at the point of the exactly. return in the... Yeah, so we have, we have a PIM. Um, PIM solution, product information management tool, and uh, we make sure that uh, for each brand we have all that information uploaded in there. Um, and then once we receive, we can you know load all the information uh, that it's supposed to be, including for example, you know pictures to identify if it's the right one, but also um, uh, enriching uh, data that was not sent in the sales order or the return order. Um, because we also move a lot cross-border, customs uh, is a thing, right? And also that we usually get from, from the PIM. Make sure, okay, country of origin, tariff codes, that kind of data is also then uh, retrieved. Yes. Yeah. I have also a question. So um, you shared with, with us that you are working in multiple uh, warehouses globally. Yeah. Um, how to standardize the workforce with the given complexity of portfolios. So you're in fashion, you're in electronics and whatever. You, you already shared that you're working with SOPs, so standard operating processes. Yeah. But in this variance of products, is it, is it possible? So, or have you separate workforces for specific needs of a portfolio? Like fashion is different than consumer electronics. You need to perform or do you keep the 
level of ex assessing an, an asset which, which is returning at a certain high level or are you going really deep? Yeah. I meaning by, you know, yeah, return yeah. reason could be a damage. Yeah. So you need to, you need to check. And in, in our case, it's a rental. As long as the asset is running, You're good. Um, yeah. we, we, we confirm it's still running. So we send it back to customer. Hey, yeah. your, your contract is, is, is ongoing. So yeah. there's no reason for returning it. But this needs a proper and deep check. Yeah, of the asset. So, how do you make this sure? I'm, I'm, I'm just interested. So, yeah. PIM, we already heard, yeah, from my colleague, and, and 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 grading is one thing. But how granular are you able to perform this grading? Yeah, and then not impacting lead times. Yeah, on multiple. Good question. Yeah. So we've been doing this for um, for over 17 years now. So we have quite some experience. Um, and the trick is, um, don't rely on brain power of operators. So make sure that the system org orchestrates everything. Um, so we have. Um, we, our warehouse system, we have, we have really tailored it to, to the op, to basically saying the operator each step of the way what they need to do. Um, and um, as I said, when you go into a, a bit more level free processing, so there it becomes a bit more tailored towards the brand, right? So you load digital SOPs, so the system as well, step by step, um, make sure that the operator is, um, is basically supported to do, fulfill that activity. We also do uh, staff training, obviously. Um, so there are certain workstations that are specialized uh, towards certain brands. That can be because of you know volumes, because just a lot of it. Uh, it can also be because of it's a bit more specific. Um, your question about how deep do you go? So we do some general um, uh, uh, checking because that's indeed what we can do in our regional return centers in each country. Um, if you want to go a bit deeper, what we typically do is centralize that activity in uh, a central hub. So we have regional hubs and we also have central hubs. And those are the hubs that are a bit more uh, um, equipped to handle the, the a bit more deeper stuff. Um, and if you really need repair, like uh, hardcore repair, then we uh, typically um, partner up with a repair uh, partner and we just make sure that we so we can do the grading is it running or not if it's not running we can sort to the uh, repair agency uh, which then repairs but it will still be within our system hello okay uh, I have one more question so are you also interacting with your your partners and customers at or after the grading level. So if there are some, some exceptions where you need an interaction, I can give you an easy example, a cloud lock of a phone, yeah. which makes an access to, to a grading impossible. You need a customer interaction. Are you also working on this level with your partners and consumers so that you uh, give an information forward and waiting for a response to facilitate the, the degrade of an asset? For yes, for yes, we also do that. Um, so we call it the task list. Um, it's um, basically the operator is blocked, so they can't do um, whatever they need to do to finish the process. And then the, the item or the product is put aside, and a task, a task is raised. And a task is then typically going to you know, the, the support team on the brand side. Um, and they will then, uh, maybe a good example is missing data, and we need to ship uh, you know, back to the UK, so we need to customs. Um, uh, customs clearance, we're missing some data because it was an unexpected item, so it was not in the sales order. Um, product is put in the quarantine, um, operator is unlocked to you know, process the next one, and someone on the brand side gets an email, hey, this product, this sales order, we're missing data, please um, fill it in whatever you can, and our system will every two days or one day will check, okay, is the data there, is the data there, is the data there, um, and if it's there, um, the operator then gets, hey, your task is now unlocked. Um, and he might have processed already thousands of other parcels, but he can then continue his work on that one. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. I hope uh, this was uh, a bit interesting. And again, if you want to talk about returns, stand E60. All right, thank you.